Dear colleagues, dear students, I have the great pleasure to welcome you today in Aix-en-Provence for the first session of the, the International Seminar on Social Media Discourse Analysis for the academic year 2022-2023. This seminar is convened by three universities belonging to the Civis Alliance, Aix-Marseille Université, Université Libre de Bruxelles, and Stockholm University and also by Maison Française d'Oxford. I would first like to thank the Lerma Laboratory, which contributes to the funding of the seminar. I am very glad to welcome my colleague, Professor Johann Sangemüller from Open University. His paper will be devoted to a very topical and current issue, the proliferation of hate speeches on social media. I will give some information about the format of the session. We will first listen to our keynote speaker, and after his paper, you will be able to react and ask him questions. During the Zoom session, I will ask you to mute your microphones during the presentation. You could switch them on again if you want to ask questions later on. You will be able to ask questions either by uh, raising your hands if you are in Aix-en-Provence or your virtual hands if you are online. You can also type questions in the chat window. It is now time for me to introduce our speaker today, Professor Johannes Angemüller. He is a professor of discourse, languages, and applied linguistics at Open University in the United Kingdom. He is also a member of the Centre d'études des mouvements sociaux at École des hautes études en sciences sociales. His main fields of research are discourse analysis linguistics, pragmatics, sociology of higher education, political communication, mass media, mass culture, and methods and theories in social research. He's the founding president of DiscourseNet, an interdisciplinary and international network of discourse researchers. He has published eight books, 18 edited books, more than 30 journal articles, and more than 60 articles and edited volumes. He's very active in editing articles. For instance, he's a member of the board of several international journals, Paul Grave Communications, Discourse Studies Collection, Journal of Multicultural Discourses, Mot les langages du politique, Langage et société, and Text and Talk. In his paper today, he will focus on right-wing discourses as he witnesses a return of fascism in contemporary social media discourse. He will go back to conceptualizations of fascism inspired by critical theory, psychoanalysis, and post-structuralism for which a discourse is not just about the rational negotiation of ideas, values, and interests. He will investigate dig digital corpora gathering publications, including populist discourse, trying to po point out the effective dimension in social media discourse. The definition of fascism given by the Oxford English Dictionary is the following one. Historically speaking, fascism is, I quote, a nationalist political movement that controlled the government of Italy from 1922 to 1943, end of quote. In a larger sense, fascism is, I quote, an extreme right-wing political ideology based on the principles underlying the system, end of quote. The title of his paper is, Truth in post-truth post politics, question mark. Discourse as a practice of social and epistemic valuation. Johannes, well, one thing to you. Thank you very much, Grégoire. Uh, Obvious because now, no.
Hello. Now, can you hear us? I think there's an echo. Um, is this echo? No, this is off. This is off. No, this is on. Hello. Okay. I, I, maybe it's not an echo, it's just a little lag. And there's some online interference. Okay, so um, it's on, we can hear. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> really sorry, we really had to struggle with the uh, technology here. And um, there's a very slight echo here in, this, in, in the room. So um, I hope that everybody can hear us and um, participate in the discussion. So what I will do is I will talk about discourse analysis as a field that, um, that studies the social production of meaning. Uh, many discourse analysts are interested in the way that language is used to produce meaning um, in certain social contexts. And there are some discourse analysts who are interested in the way that um, certain ideas and truths are established in the social space and um, um, against the background of social hierarchies and power. So um, um, this has been um, um, a very um, um, active uh, business for the last uh, 30, 40 years. Um, and more recently, um, we've, uh, find, we found this. We find new discourse analysts entering our space. And um, I read you a little quote from Liz Truss, from last December when she was Minister of Women and Equalities in the UK. Um, she gave a speech on um, social mobility and I cite from her speech here. As a comprehensive school student in Leeds in the 1980s, I was struck by the lip service that was paid to equality by the city council while children from disadvantaged backgrounds were let down. While we were taught about racism and sexism, there was too little time spent making sure everyone could read and write. These ideas have their roots in postmodernist philosophy pioneered by Foucault that put society, um, societal power structures and labels ahead of individuals and their endeavors. In this school of thought, there's no space for evidence as there is no objective view, truth and morality are all relative. Now, it's interesting to see that she cites Foucault, who's the major inspirator of um, discourse analysis, um, not only in France, but um, uh, worldwide. And she associates him with um, a kind of relativist epistemology. Um, and obviously, she, um, uh, she is in favor of um, hard truths and realities in order to uh, uh, defend um, uh, the question of um, yeah, objective knowledge. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that Liz Truss is um, a politician who has been very active in projects like this one here. Uh, you remember Brexit, uh, which was um, a campaign, a movement that um, has emerged as a consequence of a referendum that was held in 2016. And um, um, a whole space of uh, claims emerged in, in, in the context of this referendum, which were of dubious quality. And uh, people, many people said, especially the, um, um, uh, the critics of Brexit, that um, uh, the claims that were made were not uh, really um, true. Um, and I cite a few here. Um, Boris Johnson, who was uh, the major campaigner for the Vote Leave campaign, said, uh, the UK will have access to, to the single market, uh, which was a prediction that um, people said that the time was impossible um, to, um, to get. And um, as it turned out, that wasn't uh, what, what happened. Um, there's uh, other claims like um, Turkey is joining the EU, uh, which, uh, which was not true at the time. There were, of course, uh, negotiations between Turkey, Turkey and, and the EU, like uh, today, but um, it was no longer the question um, to, um, to help Turkey enter the European Union. And then there's the famous red bus 
uh, which was uh, financed by the Vote Leave campaign, uh, which, as I said, was headed by Boris Johnson, uh, which stated, we send the EU 350 million pounds a week. Let's, let's fund our NHS instead. The Vote Leave, let's take back control. Um, the number here has always been criticized as too high, and uh, Boris Johnson uh, would say just a few uh, weeks after the referendum that this is the uh, gross number and not the net number. So the net number was considerably uh, lower, uh, 150 million. And, um, and when he became prime minister, uh, there was never any talk of uh, increasing the spending for, for the public health service. So we see a number of claims here emerging around that referendum question. Uh, which, of course, uh, was not really um, held responsible by anybody because um, people could decide on something that others would then have to realize. And, um, and so others who participate in the social movement around Brexit would not really be responsible to any parliament or any voters anymore. And um, this, of course, um, helped bring about what, uh, what is widely called post-truth politics, where... Um, uh, lying is um, is a systematic um, practice of um, um, of uh, political actors to to get visibility and recognition, where the whole uh, question of truth and untruth is no longer really that um, easy to def define, and um, where many people get um, get uh, caught up in a spiral of um, of claims uh, whose um, quality is no longer that clear. And as you can see here, um, there's, I think, two um, areas of discourse. There's the very defined question of the referendum, where people um, had to say yes or no. Um, one effect was, of course, that people were divided into two camps, which have ever since been um, pitted against each other in a quite um, um, fundamentalistic way. And um, the other thing is that the meaning of this of this question was never really clear. So people could project all kinds of hopes, uh, desires, and um, and claims like like this one into these uh, uh, into these questions here, and um, and people could make them uh, without any um, responsibility, so they wouldn't be taken into account uh, uh, later on. Um, so. Um, there's one problem, as you see, that for us discourse analysts, there's some people out there in the political discourses we used to analyze who now speak back. They, they see us as enemies, as problematic, um, because we're academics criticizing them, for example. Um, I mean, that's what many discourse analysts do. I mean, you uh, might not like it and um, point taken. Um, the other thing is, and that's the more kind of fundamental thing, is that um in in these post-truth discourses and um and brexit is just one example i would say that um fascism historical fascism of the 30s is one of the most extreme examples of that kind of discourse um post-truth discourses in general um they um they um blur the line between um truth and Posters and also between um, the discourse that we analyze and um, uh, and their discourse, and um, in many ways, um, the critical uh, gesture that is very typical for discourse analysis has been replicated um, by actors in in these post truth discourses. Some may have read discourse analysts, um, I mean, um, and 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 some might be positive about it as an instrument in order to um, promote their goals and and i i just try to um um to list a few features of this um of this discourse here and and, and show you that the boundary between post-truth discourses and discourse analysis is not that easy to draw um both are very happy questioning facts and this might be perceived as unchecked lying by others and um you uh, might just change the subject position and um, take the other side and uh, and claim to do the same thing. Um, it is very important in both discourses to um, to show a critical conscience and to uh, criticize um, established facts, and also to um, 
to show um, the antagonism um, between the different camps in, in society and also in, in our own discourse. Um, there's a kind of uh, leveling of um, expertise. Um, for one, this is a democratic uh, feature of uh, public debate. For others, um, it's a problem if everybody can pose as an expert. And finally, um, one can um, diagnose uh, many different epistemologies in, in competition. And uh, some might see it as um, a good sign of plurality, uh, the way that we construct and participate in these debates uh, with different criteria and different uh, backgrounds. Whereas others um, have decried the loss of, the loss of truth as a regulatory ideal. So um, the question is how to respond to this problem that uh, for the last few years with the um, advent of populist discourses and post-truth discourses, um, um, in a way we discourse analysts are no longer um, in the illusion of being alone. We, we need to deal with people out there who also have very strong beliefs. And, um, and this is, of course, very legitimate. And, and um, uh, I would say that um, this raises some fundamental issues uh, about our place um, in society as critical scientists uh, dealing with these things. Um, there's this echo in the room, and it's slightly uh, difficult to talk fluently and maybe also to listen fluently. <laughs> Um, I um, I wonder whether there's a problem online. Oh, it's the video projector. Okay. Okay. How is it online? Is everything going okay? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, so I'll just continue, and we hope that... Um, we can still um, concentrate. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> uh, the advent of post-truth discourses is a challenge, I think, and um, discourse analysts need to think about the way that they um, deal with truth as, as an object of analysis and also criticize established knowledge. Um, indeed, if discourse is um, defined as power plus knowledge, one may ask whether populist post-truth discourses are also a kind of discourse analysis and therefore on the same level. Um, many discourse analysts have um, um, reacted um, to um, the different value conflicts in society um, in the following two ways. So the classical reaction has been either to adopt a uh, rel relativist position and say, okay, um, we can't really justify any value to be superior to any other value. This is something that people do in society and in politics. And um, what we can do is to deal with uh, value differences uh, scientifically. Uh, that, that is, we can try to understand how people make them, um, how different values um, uh, become established, and how discourse in a way works. This is a very... Um, the very classical position of the social sciences since Max Weber. Uh, Max Weber is a sociologist um, who um, made the case for a value-free science, which didn't mean that he thought that science is value-free, um, but he just said, yeah, we do deal with values in, in, in the social sciences, but uh, we can't justify one value to be superior to any other. So that's the very dominant position. Um, the other position, and that's in a way uh, the position that uh, Weber was, was critical of in um, about 120 years ago, um, that's, let's say, a moralist position or the position of the committed scientist. And um, here the idea is that we as scientists, we can't be uh, value-free, and Weber would, would totally agree. Um, and the uh, as a consequence, we take the point of view of certain um, discriminated minorities, for example, suppressed groups in society, and, um, and take their point of view in order to um, criticize uh, dominant uh, structures in society. Um, that's uh, something that is uh, very much uh, established in some fields, especially in educational um, uh, work. There's some um, action research, if you've heard about that. Uh, doing that kind of approach. In the field of intersectionality, 
uh, which has seen a, a great boom recently, um, and um, and also in linguistics. Uh, linguistics uh, has a tendency um, of um, taking um, uh, the uh, uh, moral point of view in certain uh, contexts. Um, in linguistics, discourse studies has emerged as um, as a field to deal with these uh, phenomena and uh, to deal with uh, public political discourses um, as an ongoing struggle over um, political differences, values, and all that. And there are basically two camps in, in, in discourse studies which replicate the great division between relativists and moralists in the social sciences. In discourse studies, we have uh, the division between constructivists on the one hand and realism on the other. Now, constructivists um, can be di divided into two camps. Constructivists um, um, can be interested in face-to-face -face interaction, like conversation anal analysts, uh, where basically the idea is that participants of, um, of a local discourse negotiate the social order um, through um, turn-taking um, by means of all kinds of um, semiotic resources in order to make sense of the situation. This normally concerns just a few of them, and the idea is very clearly that the social order is constructed by the participants in that situation. There's a second constructivist uh, strand in discourse studies, which is interested in macro societal order, where the question is how to account for uh, the great class structures in society, um, the discrimination between uh, major groups, um, between, um, for example, ethnic minorities and, let's say, majority uh, groups um, or racists or however you call uh, these different groups. And, uh, and here the idea is that macro societal order is um, constructed as well through discourses circulating around in society that make certain realities true. And so here the idea is for, for those large orders to exist between classes and large um, groups of, with different power, um, we need discourse that repeat um, the ideas that people have about the social order. And the more discourses repeat uh, these, these differences in, in society, um, the more those differences become real. So this is another uh, approach uh, in order to, to deal with the question of knowledge and power in, in society. Now, many people um, in linguistics who have a kind of micro social idea of discourse, like conversation anal analysts, are con uh, constructivists. Uh, then you have many sociologists and non-linguists who are inter interested in social power structures and they're constructivists. And then in linguistics, you have um, uh, quite a few realists, um, people who are interested in social power structures and um, who say, well, discourse is about establishing um, the discourse of those who have the most power in society, um, those with lots of resources, for example, and, um, um, and those who are very much established in society. And, um, and in a way, that power structure is behind discourse. So you have society as um, a power structure and discourse in a way um, is an ex expression of that power structure or it's kind of um, um, dissimulating um, that, that power structure. So it can be true or false with respect to the underlying power structure. And that's a realist idea. That's very strong in, in linguistics. And the people who um, adopt this kind of approach um, are, are normally called critical discourse analysts. Critical discourse analysts normally um, have an idea of society, of the real structure of society, and then evaluate discourse vis-a-vis uh, -vis and uh, with respect to, um, um, to that underlying power structure in which these discourses emerge and circulate. So in a way, um, there are two responses to the question of power. One response says, well, um, social order is constructed. Um, there are many ways to construct social order. And I, as the analyst, I don't care. Um, whatever um, gets established through the re repetition of discourses is real. And then, of course, what is the response of our post-truth friends? They say, okay, 
great. That's exactly what we are saying. We can have our own reality. And if there are so and so many people in Trump's uh, inauguration, then that's real. That's, of course, a problem um, if that argument is made. And um, I'm sure that nobody, nobody in that field would accept that kind of statement. Um, they're all committed to um, science as the pursuit of truth. And there's no way that we can just construct um, uh, certain realities by believing in them or by saying them. Um, there's a difference between uh, what you say and what is. Um, I, I guess most of the constructivists would say, mm -hmm, that's of course not what we meant. Um, um, of course, that's obviously wrong. And what we would say is, in order to make our knowledge even more kind of reflexive and, and strong, true in a way, we also, also always need to account for the underlying social structures in the construction of knowledge. So if there's some objective knowledge out there, um, it would be even better to understand what's the social structures that help knowledge about these objective things become established. But anyway, um, the constructivists will have difficulty responding to our post-truth people because um, in a way they don't have a strong idea of what is real or true. Now, it would be very much understandable uh, to follow our realist friends who say, oh yeah, of course, there is something out there. There's a social structure and that's real and we can't do anything about it. And discourse doesn't change anything about it. And we need to recognize uh, with statistics or whatever that there's this kind of power structure. And, um, and, and then uh, we take our point of view from um, the groups that we want to represent and uh, evaluate the discourse uh, from that point of view. And then what would our post truth friends say? Great, that's exactly what I do. I take the point of our oppressed minority. Uh, we are victims of the establishment, the deep state and what have you. And um, so, um, um, I, I can tell you that my truth is different from yours. So in a way, I would say that both um, lead us into a, a cul-de-sac and we need to um, rethink and reconceptualize the question of truth and power in discourse studies. And uh, this is what I want to suggest in this talk. Um, I want to um, start with um, the very basic intuition of discourse analysts that uh, truths and knowledge uh, circulate in a space of uh, social power. And I want to, um, to ha have a look at post-truth discourses and um, discuss why certain discourses nowadays become so established um, against the background of social power differences. Um, as I said, um, it's, um, it's a business that is important and good uh, if we want to um, uh, reveal the social uh, structures in discourse. But in the conversation with post-truth um, propagandists, we also need to say something about truth. And so I want to do two things. Um, I want to talk about um, the question of um, social hierarchies in, in discourse and how they're constructed and how they emerge in discourse, and then turn to, to the question of truth. Um, uh, we have how much time altogether? Two hours. Okay, good. Yeah, I prepared one hour, so um, I think we, we have plenty of time um, and, and we lost just a few minutes. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so in order to account for social um, power structures and discourse, um, in social media discourse, we have uh, the great opportunity to measure um, the distribution of visibility in exact mathematical ways. If you take, for example, Twitter, uh, you have all kinds of uh, Twitter accounts and um, you can analyze very easily um, the most important uh, Twitter accounts in the world, for example, and, um, and, and try to understand why um, these Twitter accounts become so important. Um, this is a quick analysis, not for myself, but um, uh, you can easily find it, um, about the 500 most important Twitter outlets in the world, uh, the, the most important Twitter accounts. 
Um, I won't go into um, the, um, the details. Um, it concentrates on the UK debate here um, around Brexit. And um, you see all kinds of actors uh, with their um, uh, different agendas uh, from from the liberal left side, uh, from from the right wing side, institutions, newspapers, different kind of actors, not only persons, but also um, 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 institutions. And um, uh, of course, this is too small. And I want to break it down into a few types of actors on Twitter. Uh, one analysis which one could do uh, when Trump still was president and um, had a Twitter account was to compare his account to all the other Twitter accounts. And this must have been from around 2000, I think, 17 or 16. I think it's just uh, shortly after um, the election. That's the left uh, graphic here, where you see um, who has the most followers on, on Twitter. And, and real uh, Donald Trump has by far the most followers, more than all the others here on the list, in, in American politics at least. And the interesting thing is that um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, uh, the young congresswoman from New York, who is um, kind of um, a populist, uh, she's categorized as a populist on the left um, in the Democratic Party, she's second. Uh, very much more important in terms of of public weight in, in Twitter uh, than any other uh, democratic polit uh, politician, including um, Obama. And that tells us a lot about the dynamics of politics uh, nowadays uh, in, the, in the age of social media. And what you can see here is um, a clear concentration of visibility among a few actors who many would categorize as populists. And uh, and uh, there's definitely a kind of uh, thinning of um, of the um, let's say the Democratic Rep Republican Center, uh, the more established politicians um, involved in kind of reconciliation between uh, different positions are, are way way less represented. And uh, and of course this is something that really explains why Clinton lost to the great surprise to her and everybody else um, to Donald Trump. Donald Trump was just so, so present and visible on social media that he just squashed everybody else. And the sheer size of his Twitter account um, meant that um, other positions didn't even get heard. And uh, that was enough to get him elected, even though people uh, were probably extremely um, critical of him. And of course, if you have a look at um, the 80 million people um, that he gathered uh, at the end of his um, Twitter account, I'm pretty sure that uh, the majority of these people were critical of, of Donald Trump. So we're talking here about a big space, a large space of discourse where lots of people participate um, from all kinds of political um, um, areas, but also from, from the media, uh, from all kinds of actors uh, who are professionals in these discourses. And um, it doesn't matter whether they're in favor of the person. They all participate in making that person visible and that explains why the person, in the end, can impose his or her agenda. And this is uh, the kind of perverse dynamics in discourse. It's, it's in a way, it's an interesting type of democracy, right, where um, there's, in a way, so much visibility, concentration of visibility in so few people by very democratic means that, at the end, um, these few people who can impose their agenda are in no way, in no way representing um, the electorate. Right. This is a very, very small part of everything, and that's why um, um, I think it's legitimate to call uh, to, to to talk about uh, post-truth politics in this case. Um, another thing that I'd like to point out, if you have a closer look at these um, analysis of hierarchies of social hierarchies of visibility in Twitter, is the following here. This was another uh, another analysis of American Twitter accounts um, and, and international Twitter accounts. Um, I think this is the, the 200 most important ones of newspapers and news corporations. Um, they all have their online uh, presence, of course, nowadays. And, um, and in this analysis, which was done, um, I think in um, 2016, um, you see that in fact, uh, we talk about very, very few outlets 
uh, which really make a difference with the content they produce worldwide. I mean, um, of course, um, we have a very um, heterogeneous space of languages, and not everybody follows English speaking discourse. So, um, uh, what you can see is only the English speaking part because um, it's uh, by far the biggest. So, these, uh, these um, numbers um, could also be done for French. Uh, where, of course, uh, the space would be a bit smaller, but you would uh, see a similar concentration of visibility in very few um, accounts of, um, of news corporations. Now, what happened around 2016 in the news space was another interesting reconfiguration of uh, visibility. And what you could see here very, uh, very clearly is um, you have a very um, strong uh, visibility of left liberal centrist uh, news outlets um, like the New York Times and uh, Huffington Post. The Washington Post is probably even a bit more kind of to the left in the US uh, than, than the New York Times. And CNN became an outspoken critic of Donald Trump. CNN used to be a bit center of the ground or slightly left leaning. But um, during the Trump years, they became very much outspoken. And you can see now why. There was a huge space of um, uptake for media that would um, 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 make critical coverage uh, about uh, right-wing populists like Trump. And left-leaning um, outlets, which were in a deep financial crisis just a, a few years before, they could refine and reconquer their audience. Um, and you see the disappearance of the traditional conservative media. Uh, I'm not sure what it's like in France. I would guess it's very much the same. Um, you had, I mean, the big um, antagonism between Le Monde and Le Figaro um, many years ago. And I don't think that Le Figaro is still that, um, that prominent, but you correct me, I, I don't follow um, newspapers um, that, um, um, uh, that closely in France. So if these hierarchies emerge in this Twitter space, this has a huge impact on the type of knowledge that is circulated. And what you can see here, of course, and that's another reason why um, there's this decisive turn to the right, there's the disappearance of the respectable conservative outlets. And, and so for, especially for conservative politicians, you see there's a very strong incentive um, to go for, for, for the populist right-wing extreme stuff, uh, which would be shared by, for example, Breitbart or Fox News. Um, and both of which, of course, um, are very much known as, um, as uh, from the extreme right or very much to the right. And um, for, let's say, the more traditional conservative um, from the 70s, um, I mean, where would these people still mobilize their, their troops? Uh, nowhere. And um, you see the same thing. If, if there's no way for people um, as, as politicians uh, to have their, their visible Twitter accounts, and if they don't have their outlets, what would they do? I mean, there's no way um, to, um, uh, to go beyond um, uh, the current uh, divide between the very right-wing people and, um, and the left of center um, orientations. Now, I point out these hierarchies as a very dynamic product. This is in no way something that is planned by anybody and this mobilizes lots of people who participate in that. And it very much interacts with the consumers, with us. We, we create this as well. It's not that they just have their agenda that exists. There are people like Rupert Murdoch, right? The Australian magnate who has um, a certain um, political agenda. And there are other people like that, and uh, that has always been like that. But they have to work with um, the demand from the many people um, participating in social media discourse, where sharing means um, getting an audience to the journalist, and they will have to to work with that. So, in a way, um, we are very much complicit with these dynamics, and um, and I want to um, to to take the moment for a first theoretical rec recapitulation of um, how to, to conceptualize discourse nowadays. I, I see discourse as a space where people enter 
in order to participate um, in projects that make them visible as subjects, uh, which means as actors, people, participants in a discourse where they have to conquer or construct over time a subject position from where they can make a difference. So people enter this discursive space um, in order to, um, to make a difference, and they need some sort of recognized position in order to do that. And that's not automatic. Yeah, you, you need to build this up. And you build this up through controversies. So you enter discourse, um, and uh, you participate in one of the very many controversies out there. And there can be very small controversies, which can give visibility um, to the few people participating. I mean, I don't know if there's um, a campus controversy, for example, here, uh, where people um, um, have a very um, excited discussion in class, for example, about some, some issue. And, um, and then some people uh, will be visible as, um, as representatives of a certain side in this controversy. Yeah? And, and uh, many people will listen. Yeah, it's not a symmetrical thing, but um, some people will bubble up in a way as major representatives of this debate. And the same happens uh, with debates around Trump. Trump, of course, is a machine of controversies, and it, it, it works just so well. And he's mobilizing not only millions, but probably billions of people nowadays through the technology that helps um, recruit these, these participants in a way. And they don't have to be uh, pro-Trump at all. That's, of course, not at all the point. But the point is, after so many exhausting discussion, um, there's one person or maybe five people who have a, a great deal of visibility. And um, this is, in a way, an effect that, that we can um, see a lot. There's um, the monopolization of discourse around very few subject position, positions. Um, through the discursive energy, the labor, the energy, the time that people um, deal with these uh, controversies through media, um, that um, some people emerge with a great deal of, um, of, of presence and visibility, and, um, and that becomes real in a way. That's something that other actors will have to to, to, to recognize as, as a reality, and, um, and, and that means discourse is anything but equal. Yeah, I mean, everybody can, of course, equally have a Twitter account and say something. But uh, if you consider these dynamics, um, there's no equality at all. And, and so democracy, in a way, um, is, is an inadequate concept to account for what's going on in real life discourse um, nowadays, but also in the past. Now, that's one thing. You have these many controversies. And they all follow different standards. They have different histories. Yeah, and um, it's difficult to compare different uh, controversies. I think we always need to to recognize their different stakes, different questions, and different um, people, of course, involved. And what happens in many controversies is, and that's very important. That makes a big difference. Um, there's something um, where some people are picked from those who become visible as official spokespersons. For example, in something called elections. Elections um, are discursive dynamics around controversies um, fed by certain actors in order to be elected. And then, of course, they have an official position in the institution. This is something that you find in politics, of course, um, in Western democratic politics, very much common. You find it in many other fields. Think of, for example, art. Um, artists compete for recognition and visibility uh, through their works. And, um, and then there are museums. And who gets into a museum, right? This is a point where somebody's selected through some procedure or some, somebody decides, somebody has the power to decide. Oftentimes it's artists themselves, of course, but it's not that everybody uh, remains on the same kind of reputational visibility. Sometimes reputation is, is turned into something else. And that is very important to understand um, as a social mechanism where reputation is transformed into some sort of official institutional position. 
and sometimes also into something else like um, um, money, um, economic power, or political power. And I don't need to refer you to Donald Trump um, to, to see how this works, right? I mean, the Twitter account and the social media presence that he had, has, is very, very, very important in all kinds of um, interesting things. And it's not just um, something abstract. It's really the currency um, of today's public discourses. Okay, <clears throat> so we've had a look at discourse as a very much social um, practice, right? Where you see many people participating and over time in these sometimes unforeseen dynamics of, of controversies, there are certain hierarchies and um, visibilities that are just distributed um, in a quite unequal way. And, um, and sometimes these hierarchies are also undone. I mean, of course, I mean, you have new controversies and old hierarchies will um, collapse or be replaced by new ones. So that's kind of, these are cycles and, um, and um, controversies are very important in order to reproduce um, existing hierarchies. If, if, if you don't have controversies, these things will die down and um, this has a very strong social effect. The question now is you have all these very visible subjects, subject positions in discourse. And of course, from these very different subject positions and different controversies, very different things are said and claimed. And the truth quality of these different things um, are not the same. And I think that's where discourse studies should start to think about something like truth, um, something like the quality of debate, uh, uh, the way that um, we can account for something being more real or less real um, with respect to certain standards. And uh, that's the, the stuff that constructivists normally don't do. And normally the, the realists say, okay, um, the reality is just there, uh, which I think is, as you see, maybe not a quite um, convincing answer, given that it's very dynamic and it's totally discursive. So, I mean, these hierarchies are really kind of uh, part and parcel of these very linguistic practices, right, of um, saying something, um, sharing tweets, producing contents. This is all um, language. So it's not that there's something behind that that could be even more real than what is done through language in certain cases. That's why I suggest, let's have a look at the way that truths are said, to be very blunt, <laughs> uh, from these different places that do make a difference in that social space of, of public discourse. And I've um, taken just one very arbitrary example here from Donald Trump, um, who we all know. Um, and I'm sorry, because I think there's so many interesting things out there in society, uh, which um, which deserve so much attention. And of course, I mean, as you might imagine, I'm not exactly a friend of Donald Trump's. Um, and I'm totally aware that with this talk, I feed into exactly his business of making that guy even more visible in our uh, context where he maybe shouldn't be an authority. However, he takes part in academic discourses, just like the list trust does. Um, or maybe not just like her, but um, um, the difference between our discourses as academics and scientists and their discourse as political, uh, political uh, actors can't really be separated that easily. And of course, I mean, I'm a citizen, I take part in political discourses, where should we stop? And, and we produce truths, I hope, and that's what our business should be as, as scientists and academics. And that's, of course, to make a difference in society and not only in our little bubble of uh, highly specialized, arcane and super irrelevant um, academics. So let's have a look at how Donald Trump participate, participates in, in the game of uh, constructing truths, scientific truths, let's say, right? Which points to all kinds of other controversies uh, which we always also need to, to look into. And I took here the example from a debate in 2020 at the beginning of um, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, when, of course, um, Donald Trump was very much embroiled in all kinds of um, controversies about the reality of the virus and whether this is deadly or not and how to, what to do. And, and he was uh, making the claim that there's a cure 
for COVID-19. And he was banking on the idea that there are some drugs out there that we can use in order to, to put an end to the pandemic. Like all of us, right? I mean, this is nothing uh, very um, shocking or illegitimate, of course. And, um, and so he posts the following here. Hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin taken together have a real chance to be one of the biggest game changers in the history of medicine. The FDA, which is the agency which um, authorizes new drugs, Fauci, I think, I think Fauci was the um, president of uh, the, the, the director of, uh, of, uh, of the FDA, which is the kind of, he became the counter part of Trump's as the voice of reason and, um, and science to counter the, the pandemic. And, and um, they really um, had a very difficult uh, 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 conflict. The FDA has moved mountains. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully they will both, um, H works better with A, International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents, be put in use immediately. People are dying, move fast, and God bless everyone. Um, what I want to point out here is that um, he makes a claim about um, the workings of some new drug the um, pharmaceutical effects and the possibility of a cure, which uh, is a very strong claim uh, because it will have to stand the test of time. Normally people, I mean, including uh, politi politicians, but especially academics, they don't want to make uh, claims to test the, the stand of time because there's a very strong uh, probability they, they will turn out wrong. For academics, this is a problem because then they're disqualified or discredited in their community and they might not be heard uh, by any other uh, people. For Donald Trump, this is not a big problem, which is interesting. It is a big problem for many other politicians, of course, who will have to, to step down um, after things like that, if that's not the, uh, the case. Um, in fact, if we have a look at the um, process of getting hydroxychloroquine admitted uh, by the FDA, this is a quite an interesting process if you want to understand how how scientific truths are established because they're all kinds of actors they're trials uh, they're people uh, with expertise to decide on whether the results from these trials um, are sufficient in order to um, to um, um, to um, to authorize these um, uh, uh, these drugs and so um there was um, a French doctor uh, Didier Raoult uh, who I think you you, you know who, who very strongly made this claim, and, and he got it from him. Um, Trump um, uh, cited uh, Raoult's work somewhere. I, I don't think this is the, his work here. I'm not sure. And, um, and so um, you, you see how these different controversies are sometimes um, enmeshed and, and work together. And, um, and of course, um, the effect of one controversy on the other is sometimes very important. Um, the fact of sharing this in, in, in a Twitter account, which reaches millions of people, um, is a very problematic thing, of course, to do for academics who need some sort of space of freedom in order to work on these things without these very strong pressures. And, um, and of course, the problematic thing about this claim is not the claim, because it looks like any kind of innocent contribution to some sort of scientific um, debate. But in this context, it, um, it creates new realities, uh, which might be um, difficult for those um, um, in, in laboratories and, and clinical trials to just um, get, a, get a sense of what's going on. And so it might be seen as bullying. Um, and um, I guess that's, um, that's, uh, that's um, uh, what, what, what it was in a way. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is now, um, we have here a rather exceptional example of um, um, a claim on the factual truth of something, right? I mean, this is, I think, important for discourse. Um, people enter discourses to make factual claims. There's many other things going on in discourse. It's not only about factual truth. And... Um, uh, but the point, of course, is um, that if you make factual claims and they turn out to be wrong, that will fall back on the claimant, right, on the claim maker. 
And so there's at least two things here which are important. One thing is, uh, is the claim up to what it claims? In many cases, um, it's about the future and it will turn out to be true or for, for wrong. In the end, um, academics um, active in this area um, 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 came to the conclusion that uh, it is wrong. So it's not something that, that works and they don't use uh, hydroxychloroquine. The other thing is that uh, if you make factual claims, of course, um, you will make your subject position more or less credible, depending on the claims. So there's not only the question of the factuality of the claim, but there's also the credibility of, um, of the claim maker. And, and of course, um, that's very important because we just don't have a time in discourse to follow everybody. So what happens is we normally try to follow those we have trust with and then and we try to get an idea of who's trustworthy. Um, and, and, and so we have a perception of these claims out there, which, which various uh, participants make in this course, uh, which depend in, in certain ways on the credibility, the trust we place in them. Uh, that's, I think, a very common thing. Um, and of course, I guess that even um, the, um, um, the supporters of Trump and of Johnson normally wouldn't really bank on the factuality and the credibility of the claims they make. They're very, very good at and, and creating social hierarchies and, and visibility. They mobilize troops, they create social entities, they, they create action, right? Um, but on, on the epistemic side, let's say, on, on the question of whether the claims they make, that's a different thing. And I think that's exactly the difference that we should be aware of in discourse studies. There are social hierarchies, and there's also epistemic hierarchies. And we need to distinguish between both. And I think um, uh, even many of the people out there in political discourse would be totally fine with that idea, that social hierarchies do not um, uh, convert, transform into, into epistemic hierarchies automatically. That's, I think, if discourse analysts say said, uh, uh, have, have thought so, I think that's, uh, that's a mistake. And I, I would guess that's the big problem with certain constructivist um, types of discourse analysis, where the idea is that social hierarchies automatically turn into epistemic hierarchies. And I think we need to distinguish between both. And so um, I'm, I'm slowly getting to the end now. Um, I want to um, to complement the model of social visibility um, that uh, that I presented um, about social media discourse with a model where we need to distinguish between at least two types of valuation in discourse. We saw the um, um, the social uh, ways of creating hierarchies between people, right? Um, I don't repeat that. And one thing is to create very visible subject positions. So you, you take part in a social game around who becomes recognized as somebody who makes a difference. And the other thing is uh, there's resonance. Yeah, so um, there's followers, there's all kinds of um, uh, partisans, um, there's pro and uh, against, there's um, groups that align according to, to certain um, uh, um, leaders. And, and so the social space in a way is um, divided between certain leaders and certain followers. And, and uh, in a way, that's how politics works. You mobilize people, and there's a difference between those who lead them and um, the led people. And, um, and of course, uh, with, uh, with discourse, uh, we can understand that this is not only just um, pre-discursive stuff. I mean, we, they really need to go through the controversies in order to create that order. So. Um, the, the discursive construction of social order is very important. And, um, and of course, this is articulated with all kinds of non-discursive things like economic power, political power, what have you, right? So it's, it's a, a space where many different types of, um, of, um, of resources are mobilized. And um, if you've heard of Pierre Bourdieu, uh, La Théorie de, uh, de, de, de la Production Symbolique, um, you can analyze that very well with, with Bourdieu, for example. 
But I think um, people like Bourdieu and also most discourse analysts, they should have a sense for the epistemic hierarchies of the different type of quality that we attach to different claims that are made in discourse around these subject positions. And not everything that is claimed has the same truth value. And um, this can't be collapsed with existing social hierarchies. So you might have um, a very <laughs> strong um, uh, Twitter account, but that doesn't make um, hydrox hydroxychloroquine a cure for COVID-19. Very simple as that. And, um, and I think um, that's why we have two competing hierarchies in at least two, probably more, but uh, that's what I want to, to take home from this, uh, from this presentation. Two competing hierarchies of, uh, of creating difference and inequality in discourse, and, and only one of them is social, and the other is epistemic. Um, it's about uh, the way that some claims, some discourses are truer than others, and not everything is, is the same. And I think it's very important to recognize um, that many things are said, and, and sometimes many things can be said, but not always. Uh, but in no way are these things all the same. The people are not the same. They don't have the same power. They don't have the same um, subject position. And um, the quality of what they say is not the same. And this is something I think that we can recognize as uh, discourse analysts without um, falling into that um, um, wrong trap between constructivists and realists, right? Um, who in a way um, try to um, um, to replicate one hierarchy by the other in, in most cases. So I think we need to see the difference between both. Now, before I, before I end, um, I think we need to, to think a bit about um, our place as scientists, as academics, as specialized knowledge producers, in um, in these discourses, which are never just political or just scientific. It's in many ways a mix of those, and there's no clear boundary, boundary lines, never, because we're always both. And um, I want to end uh, with a reflection on what happens in academic discourse um, and science. And what we can see is very similar things. Um, um, social hierarchies do not only exist, of course, in public political discourses where people mobilize uh, fake Twitter accounts in order to, um, to spread um, fake news, right? Um, social hierarchies is definitely something that we can see in, in any specialized arena of uh, professional communication, um, including in the scientific and the academic uh, arena. And you see lots of different controversies in, in, the, in the scientific se sector. You have different disciplines, for example. You have um, subdisciplinary fields um, with a few people embroiled in, in controversies. You have transdisciplinary fields. Many people are part of two or three controversies. Um, some people are part of one controversies and they just, I mean, rise as the reference of that new controversy and their career is done. Um, others um, participate without ever being cited. Um, it's, it's a very social space. And I'm not saying that everything is equal um, in terms of the truth value of what is said. Uh, there are many things that are claimed in this discourse and, and some things fly. Um, sometimes that doesn't mean that everybody's okay. Um, you have sometimes the, um, the effect of visibility uh, from some people who um, have very, very um, controversial uh, claims and who can then impose certain things. Um, but people do recognize all the time that even though some things are not said by many people, um, there's a lot of value in what they say. So there's respect for the niches, uh, for the different traditions as well. And, um, and of course, there are lots of conflicts in the space. You have different um, um, epistemologies. Um, I mean, somebody who does psychoanalysis will not get together with somebody in, trained in, uh, in positivistic social sciences. They will not understand each other. Um, and there's thousands of examples like that. So you have different cultures of, of participating in this, um, in this game. Um, and um, as a result of all the time and energy 
people, and many people are not getting any visibility from this game. There will be some things more established than others. Some things, some ideas, knowledges will bubble up at the end of the day after generations sometimes, um, which are something which can be called like established knowledge. And in some cases, in many cases, such knowledge um, works in many contexts and uh, in, 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 in many situations. And, um, and sometimes uh, this, um, this knowledge might have little social value in terms of mobilizing troops because it's very boring, right? It's for the nerds, but it has very high epistemic value. And, and so uh, <clears throat> uh, we can perfectly see that across these different uh, fields, there are lots of um, struggles over truth. And of course, there's lots of struggles between science as a sector and the non-scientific debates, as we could see in, 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 in uh, Donald Trump. So um, um, just to remind you of um, the social uh, dynamics in, 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 um, in, 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 in the scientific discourse, uh, that's another part of my specialty to work on academics as social um, actors. And um, I, um, I, um, I did an analysis of the way that citations are distributed as a marker of, of citation visibility in, in academic discourses. And I took all the linguists in, in the UK, France, and Germany, all the professors, the established senior academics in these fields. And I counted the, um, uh, the citations. And I saw that among all the 100 um, uh, specialists in, um, in uh, discourse analysis um, in, in, in the three countries, um, there are about 99 um, um, that, that I could identify. And I'm pretty sure it's, it's everybody. Uh, about 10% of all these professors are cited more than all the other professors. So we see a very strong concentration of visibility in, um, in our field, which is a very social thing. Um, it doesn't mean that everything that comes from the two people who are cited by everybody else um, say better things all the time. But but you see, it's um, it, it can be, I mean... Um, a system where where people are incited to engage in in, in fake news discourse, um, like what we could see in the Twitter space, um, people get the attention for for the most outrageous stuff, and so there's a great um, reason to 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 post stuff which uh, which is obviously wrong. But sometimes um, we might also find some controversies where such hierarchies can can work the other way around. It can also push people into uh, producing stuff. Uh, which is um, extremely specialized, um, of, of an extremely rare quality, let's say, and uh, which can um, can pay people <laughs> who are otherwise uh, have no reason uh, in order to um, to spend all their time um, to, to write books and read and, and 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 participate in these discourses. So I'm coming to an end um, to my uh, presentation, which is um, more of a theoretical uh, reflection on the question of truth and power in our uh, contemporary discourse, rather than a linguistic analysis, which would be a different um, uh, a thing to do. Uh, and I'd be very happy to, um, to, to, um, to do that in, in another uh, context. Um, what I presented here is um, a, um, a, a strong, what I would call a strong account of truth and post-truth in discourse studies. I call it strong because, um, I um, try to come up with an explanation of truth and post-truth, uh, which is symmetrical. I tried to uh, account for epistemic hierarchies um, in science in the same way as I would account for epistemic hierarchies in, in the non-scientific areas. And, um, and this is um, a third way beyond perhaps constructivism and realism as we try to understand um, the social um, and discursive and epistemic hierarchies that um, emerge in discourse over time in science and non-scientific um, uh, discourse. And of course, we are very much aware of the very delicate boundary line between both. And um, I want to, um, to end uh, with, um, with an invitation to take seriously the epistemic um, hierarchies that are constructed in discourse.
and uh, recognize um, the strong truths um, that we can gather in certain discourses and that we can use in order to criticize other discourses uh, which have um, less epistemic value. And um, so I would define critique not um, as um, using big Twitter accounts, squashing um, everybody else with a pure sh sheer size of, um, of that power, but I would understand um, a critical project um, for um, discourse analysts, but also for non-scientists uh, scientists, as the use of these strong truth values in order to criticize um, discourses which are purely based on um, social hierarchies. So thank you very much. I hope this is um, some food for thought and I'm very much interested in your thoughts. Thank you so much, uh, Johans, for your wonderful presentation. Very interesting and fascinating. Um, I'm sure uh, you will have a lot of questions. I have myself uh, some questions, of course, but uh, I think I will uh, give way to, to the audience, probably from, uh, from, from the internet through Zoom. So if you have questions, please ask them in the chat and you can uh, open your microphone as well. And then I will ask questions for you. In the audience here in Aix-en-Provence. Can you hear me well? I, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Diego, you have a question. Diego, we are listening to you. Um, hi, can you hear me? Uh, just, uh, Can you hear me? Thank you for your seminar. Um, I was wondering whether the, the well, it might, it, it's not exactly about your presentation, but your, um, the, one of the last slides you um, presented where, um, in which I mean, uh, 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 you talked about the, the 99 uh, professors in uh, uh, in uh, discourse analysis. Thank you. And um, I was wondering whether uh, we could um, compare this, um, I mean, you, um, you might already, you might already done it, but uh, can we compare this, uh, make a comparison between or, or uh, an extrapolation of uh, this field, um, discourse, discourse analysis with all the others? So that is to say, can we say that even if it's not the case that the, the, the scientific sphere works like Twitter 
in uh, in which uh, and uh, yes can we say this i'm not sure if i was clear enough <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you for for this question and um uh, what you can see is that um um, in a field like discourse studies, there's a strong um, concentration of visibility in the hands of very few. Um, this, of course, is an effect of everybody participating. It's not just those who are visible, right, who um, are, deserve, in a way, um, the reputation and the recognition, but it's, um, it's an effect of everybody participating in the controversy. And... Um, from what I can see in, in my data from, from other fields, um, it's, um, it's basically what you can uh, expect from most fields. I mean, the 10% rule that 10% of the active professors at any given point in any given field uh, cited more than all the other professors is something that is very, very typical. It's not an, at all um, uh, exceptional. It's interesting uh, to have a look at uh, different languages. And um, uh, the worst uh, was uh, French. <laughs> Uh, there was one person um, basically um, getting 56% of everything. And, um, and we're just talking about the most senior academics and um, the less uh, established academics um, below the professorial level are not even included in these figures. So you can see that there's a very, very strong monopolization of, um, of public discourse. And I think um, that's uh, something uh, that in in some way uh, you would also um, of course see in, in in Twitter and 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 in 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 most cases where many people kind of come together to talk publicly, right? It's um, it's very difficult um, to have public discourse without these very very strong um, hierarchies because of course you can't follow more than two or three people um, bickering with each other. You need uh, a kind of reduction um, of um, the debate on 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 few sides. There's a cognitive limit um, to following all, all kinds of different reactions. So there's a very kind of um, natural, perhaps, if you can say so, um, tendency to um, to pick um, a few representatives that monopolize uh, the debate, and um, they will then um, 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 produce these hierarchies uh, that uh, that I said. And uh, and I think the political thing um, in all that um, to, to reflect on is that, of course, there's a tendency to forget. That, um, uh, that the value that they embody, uh, the few people who are recognized as visible subjects, that the value that they embody is of course a product of everybody in the field, whether they're cited um, or not, whether they're visible or not. And um, they would be possible uh, without uh, the thousands or the millions out there um, who participate, who cite without being cited and um, who 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 click uh, without being clicked, and um, this is how um, how they produce something that, at the end of the day, is very real and which needs to be recognized as um, as 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 a kind of social structure where um, relevance is is very much um, limited to 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 a certain group, but also um, as a truth, right? That um, that is sufficiently strong and established to um to stand the test of time and uh, and that's uh, something where where there's a mechanism of invisibilizing uh, lots of people who give uh, lots of their work and their uh, their time um and so i think um that's uh, that's something where both fields the scientific field and the non-scientific field are quite quite similar uh, whether you have a 10 percent rule in in social media i don't know i guess um with something like Trump, um, the hierarchy is even higher. I think it's very much about the one percent versus the ninety-nine percent, or something like that, and um, and that 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 would need to be studied by somebody else. I've I've tried to to respond to 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 the general thrust. Is um, is there any other specific aspect that you um, are interested, perhaps, in? Oh uh, no. No, that, that that was it. Thank you very much. I will take one question from the audience in X.
that was made more of a comment in the question to the minister, especially regarding the new pamphlet and the importance of the council of others and the cited the ability of the university. And I thought that it was so interesting to make it to the table because I know that some news outlets have um, articles that are pretty great to your pamphlets, and most of the time it's uh, right wing conservative um, outlets are being published and easily assessed what's more uh, scientific and uh, concrete with evidence and backups uh, are behind paywalls. So I was thinking that it is also linked to this difficulty uh, that you talked about, and it's something that might happen to them to encounter as to this epistemic um, reclaiming that you were talking about, and that maybe we will need more free access to um, actual um, knowledge, actual truth um, regarding this kind of it's more of a comment than a question. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great question. and. Um... And uh, we definitely need to think along those lines. And um, I hope um, that um, that you see that's exactly the type of, of, of problem that uh, I'd like to invite you to see. Um, the problem with the traditional journalists is that they work for um, um, for, for, for a body that has a reputation to lose. And um, that's why um, journalists are professionals. They, um, they're fact checkers, they're gatekeepers in those cases, they have a reputation to lose. And um, that's why um, there are all kinds of mechanisms. Um, there's a certain training. Um, there, there's also lots of resources um, in, um, in the editorial board, for example, that help them to get to something that stands the test of time. Um, I mean, at least factual claims um, have to be true and balanced in, in kind of traditional journalism. And, um, and that means that um, if it works well, the journalists and the paper, I mean, in, in most cases, it's a paper, uh, they will have credibility. And, um, and that's expensive. And that's why they have to, to think about um, new revenue in the new Twitter um, and Facebook era, where I, I haven't bought it a, a paper in, in 30 years and I, I read um, the news every day so um, obviously um, the new dynamics are very dangerous for that kind of um, culture of gatekeeping and, um, and fact checking and uh, professional kind of um, journalism um, the, the fake news sites which I also read um, because I, um, I find them very interesting for my work uh, they don't have that obviously I mean they just um, share whatever is liked and that's very, very much less expensive. And um, and then you see that strange mix of things which are good and um, interesting in a positive way, but but you see these outrageous um, um, claims about uh, the vaccine or whatever, and um, uh, conspiracies uh, conspiracies about immigrants and 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 stuff that is um, so wrong that um, I mean you just see it and there's no difference uh, in that space anymore so um obviously um yeah i mean this is very much uh, about the way that um economic political and um discursive power um need to be rebalanced and and i think what we're going through is is a moment of um of crisis in public discourse uh which um which uh, which is triggered by a new medium by social media um, which um, create all kinds of new hierarchies, as I mean, this is very evident, but also new kind of economic challenges and um, possibilities. I mean, it can go absolutely two ways. I mean, um, journalists um, who get the followers, um, um, they um, um, they can become freelance um, and, and 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 create new spaces of 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 of, of a public debate. It's not a kind of um, unambiguously bad thing at all um and i think the the problem is that whenever you have a, a major new medium a, a new media technology um it is a huge challenge for 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 existing social structures and um, i just uh, remind you of the invention of the printing press uh which led people to um to to print the bible and um uh read the bible themselves and um and print uh, leaflets about interpretations of the Bible, and that that led to many years of war. 
and um, the radio was equally uh, disruptive um, in 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 the 20s uh, when when the fascists who are the model for this kind of discourse um, um, occupied uh, public uh, discourse together with the murders of the time and um, uh, and existing kind of political kind of actors but that was um, I think um, a transitional period uh, where all of a sudden um, a new type of actor totally unbound by existing established criteria standards or professional links um, could totally squash and crash um, into the public space and then um, yeah sometimes um, lead to um, disaster and um, so um, I hope that this is not the case this time uh, but uh, there's a danger and that's why I would have talked about fascism as well as um, as, um, as a very real um, um, problem um, I think I would have had to talk much more about the historical specificity of, of fascism because it's very um, cheap to say um, use these big words and I think um, I wanted to concentrate on, on, on a bit more kind of um, systematic research here and uh, try to, um, um, to, to perhaps uh, spare these other considerations about historical analogies for, for another time. Any other question here at X or in the chat? Have a question. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. The, the question is, do you know if Trumpism is widespread among American academics? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I can tell you that Trumpism is not widespread among American academics. Trumpism has a very clear social base, or, um, and it's not higher education. Um, there has been a clear tendency within higher education in, in, in the US, especially um, among the most elite and research-oriented institutions, um, that you will normally know. I mean, there's a whole system of, of lower higher education colleges, uh, which are um, a bit less um, clearly oriented, um, but the clear tendency is um, um, there are almost no Trumpists in academia. And um, um, it's interesting to, uh, to ask why. Um, I did some research on that. that. That's why I can really say that. Um, there was a a strong, it started in the 80s. Academia is, uh, used to be much less polarized in academia between um, right-wing and left-wing people. Uh, there was a big, bigger center. Um, and um, I guess uh, academia was a bit more kind of um, humanist, a bit more collegial, uh, less managerial. Um, and and society was much less polarized. It started with Reagan, and um, and that was the kind of initial kind of um, uh, polarization that led many people outside academia to 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 mobilize for right wing people. But the opposite took place in in in, in lots of academia, especially in the social sciences and and uh, in the humanities, which had been less left wing oriented in the 60s and 70s. So um, it was only in the 80s that American academics turned to, to the left. And um, you have um, uh, that effect, which um, I think is very much linked to all kinds of social processes of recognition in society where um, their, their struggles over recognition in, in, in non-scientific contexts uh, between the countryside and um, urban centers, for example. Um, that's something that you can see in France as well. It's less uh, less so in France, uh, but there's a very clear tendency. The center, the city centers, which used to be, by the way, very bourgeois, um, Paris, um, uh, Bordeaux, uh, are quite bourgeois right-wing uh, cities. But for the last 10 years, I mean, they've become more more, more, more bobo and um, they have become much more left-leaning and uh, liberal, um, very much um, anti, anti FN um, and, and, and Front National, and what are they called now? Rassemblement, uh, whatever. I mean, and um, and I think the same is uh, the case in um, in um, in the US and and worldwide, where um, higher education represents a kind of um, um, universal cosmopolitan 
um, internationalist um, global culture, uh, which is very much um, uh, under attack by people who defend uh, the local experience um, in, um, in, 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 in areas which don't get visibility. Because think about who gets visibility here. It's the urban centers, all the major series. It's about young people in urban centers, um, in certain urban centers, New York, London, Paris. Um, can you name a major series which is not based um, from France, which is um, not based in, uh, in, in Paris? They are. But I mean, you see that there's a model very much defined um, in these um, urban centers. And when I go to Canal Saint-Martin, I, I, I see higher education subjects on the canal having picnic, right? And, and enjoying uh, the kind of um, being together with that kind of um, culture that is, um, that is acquired in higher education institutions. Um, this is very much uh, centered in, in humanities and social scientists. So I think what, what happens is universities nowadays, they, um, they train, they produce subjects that, that, that represent that model um, on, on Canal Saint-Martin. And, um, and, and that's what, what, uh, what produces a counter reaction. And, and so you, you have these, these uh, very strong um, populist discourses, which, which are really much about these, um, these questions. Who, who is visible? Who represents society? And is it, um, is it us or them? Is it those in Canal Saint-Martin? Or is it those um, um, who are in, a, um, in, in an unknown um, suburb or, or, or countryside uh, village? Are there any other questions? That one of the main reasons that Trump won the election uh, was because of his uh, notoriety on social media and uh, because he was uh, somehow a controversy magnet and uh, he was always attracting attention. Uh, however, I remember uh, having heard many times from uh, many. Uh, mainstream media sources uh, blaming uh, Russia for uh, Trump's uh, success in the election. I'm just uh, very curious about uh, the credibility of these claims or uh, whether they're just uh, part of the anti Russia discourse. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, there's, of course, um, Lots of actors, professional actors, um, participating in these, and they perfectly understand how this works, and they work precisely on the distribution of visibility in in this game, right? And um, and um, I um, I would say that um, um, in hindsight, um, I think there's a, a clear interference uh, from Russian. Um, state-sponsored uh, trolls. Um, I think that's uh, pretty much um, clear. That's not, not a lie. Um, I don't think um, that these trolls made a big difference, however. Um, I think um, it's legitimate to um, be upset about um, foreign governments trying to man man manipulate um, elections. Um, but I think um, the effect was not that strong. I mean, the question then, of course, since elections are always very, um, uh, very narrow, um, the same could be said about the Brexit referendum, which was also 52-48, uh, right? It's, it's a very, very narrow margin. Um, would it be uh, the 2%? I, I would be skeptical, um, but... Um, uh, I guess what we should see is uh, there's, I mean, the whole space of social media, which just does the job uh, for free um, <laughs> uh, for, for these actors. And, and so um, 
I know that there was a very, very strong activity in 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 the run-up to the Brexit referendum from uh, from Russian um, um, trolls um, and and probably also from other trolls, sometimes probably not quite easy to quite distinguish uh, who it was. And it was interesting to see that in the Brexit referendum, um, that uh, all the polls before and after um, predicted um, um, the victory of Remain. And uh, it was just um, um, switching in, in, in the two weeks before. So, um, and that was precisely when the trolls were active and that was four weeks. Um, they, I mean, those actors, um, they were active, um, I guess in that specific circumstance of the Brexit referendum, they might have had um, sufficient uh, clout just in that specific window. I don't think this would still be possible. And um, about Trump, I guess um, they didn't have enough uh, power to to really rig the elections uh, in that sense. And um, um, I, I, I guess it's more of a political problem of... Um, of a president who who seems to be under uh, the control of Putin, and um, so um, there was a strong incentive to um, to remind uh, Trump and his um, and his party of um, of the problem by creating um, discourses about that. And um, I think it, it's important to um, to have a good precise account of the real impact of of these actors. Uh, and um, that's that's difficult, of course. I have noticed uh, the omnipresence of visibility in your talk. Mm -hmm. You use this term yeah. several times, and I was wondering if um, there, there was a link between visibility on the one hand and the production of a particular ethos on mm -hmm. the other hand. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's very similar, and it's almost. I mean. I prefer visibility because it's a bit more of a social sciencey term, mm -hmm. and ethos is very much from rhetorics and um, uh, the, a certain type of discourse analysis. Um, and uh, I, I guess it's um, it's almost interchangeable. Uh, I guess ethos is more connected to the idea of um, of a genre, uh, which is a way to account for discourses which wouldn't start uh, with. Um, systematic uh, social research, but it would start with the idea that we can identify certain patterns and can come up with certain taxonomies uh, through um, more intuitive um, uh, research, uh, which uh, I find totally legitimate um, and I've, I've done it myself. And um, I, um, I, I guess that um, uh, ethos, um, points back to uh, a discussion which uh, I think sh I should perhaps mention here because it's um, it's related to logos and 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 pathos so I mean you see of course in in, in my talk it's very much about um, the connection between um, a certain type of subjectivity which is uh, ethos it's very much about affect which is um, pathos and it's very much about um, rational thought uh, which is uh, logos so um, 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 I mean, if you analyze um, texts as, um, as as you would probably do, you would um, uh, you would um, probably have in mind that um, certain speech acts, certain texts um, can refer to these three things. Um, 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 at the same time, and yeah. they're interconnected uh, within a, a single speech act. And um, and, and here, um, I mean, I'm talking about the wide context. And uh, and so I, I would think that um, that we should connect both. Um, and and um, and of course, um, if we analyze linguistic material, we would um, we would see traces of these things um, in various ways. Um, um, what kind of allusions and um, reference to these different dimensions of, of discourse um, in, in, in every single speech act. Um, but then I think the interesting thing is also to to, to think about um, the context in, in such a systematic uh, empirical way and to think about distributions 
and inequalities that, that we can account for with um, with all kinds of methods uh, from the social sciences. Because uh, if we don't do that, we might be under the impression that any speaker can create um, pathos. That's not true. It's very, very much situated in, in the social historical space. And, um, and so um, uh, something that uh, uh, Trump does, I mean, I think that's the background of my uh, example here from hydroxychloroquine. I mean, I mean, we just, we really need to understand the dynamics leading to this very specific social historical subject position of Trump's in order to understand uh, why this is bullying. And the same could be said by um, a very respectable med uh, med medical expert, and uh, it would be something totally different. And, and, and so that's why uh, I always try to remind um, my, my, uh, my friends in linguistics, um, it's, um, it's important to, to go a step further into the empirical side of, uh, of the things. And, and context in, in linguistics is usually something which is, um, 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 is, is um, conceived through the in intuitive method. And uh, I mean, there's lots of other, uh, I mean, uh, social scientists in linguistics, I mean, ethnography and social linguistics who who study um speech acts in their in their in their environment so that's uh, i mean a very big field right um but i think if we want to account for for social power as the context um as as, um, as is my background here then i think it's not enough um to just posit it as the kind of background like the realists do in linguistics where uh, they have a very strong idea of um, the social power um, and the distribution of of, of resources in, 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 in this course um, without ever really uh, trying to account for it in, in a more systematic social scientist way. And, um, and this is something uh, which can't be done through intuition. And I think that's why realism is so strong in linguistics because uh, from from their kind of discipline, they have um, learned to to um, to analyze discourse through intuition, which works in many ways, um, but not for context. For context, I would always say, let's have a look at at social historical specific cases. So I think I should conclude. One, once again, I want to thank our keynote speaker today, and also. Uh, the whole audience, either in X or yeah. online, of course. Thank you so much. Uh, the next session of the seminar will deal with pseudonyms, trolling, and fake news. Uh, I will welcome in Aix-en-Provence on the 27th of February, Dr. Bernie Hogan from the Oxford Internet Institute from uh, half past four, French time. It will also be a hybrid session you will also have so the possibility to follow this event on Zoom. Uh, the title of his paper will be, Must Everyone Know Who Everyone Else Is? Pseudonyms, Proper Names, and Local Accountability. He will analyze examples from uh, Twitter, Facebook, 4chan, Wikipedia, and TikTok. You will find the abstract of his talk on the research blog of the seminar, issmda.hypothesis. Org. Thank you so much to everyone and see you soon. Thank you.